we're still at UL now. Okay. All right, well, welcome. Welcome to the University of Arizona's College of Law Faculty Book Talk Series. I'm Teresa Miguel Stearns, Associate Dean and Director of the Law Library. This afternoon's book talk features Professor Carolyn Williams in conversation with Professors Paul Bennett and Diana Simon. They will be discussing Professor Williams's new book, the seventh edition of the Allwood Guide to Legal Citation, which explains legal citation formats for all types of documents and sources in a clear and pedagogically sound manner. Carolyn Williams is Associate Professor of Legal Writing and Assistant Clinical Professor of Law. She has dedicated her academic career to teaching students how to be good lawyers. She teaches legal research, analysis, and communication, and intensive legal research and writing. Professor Williams is also a sought-after consultant who frequently teaches those in the larger legal community, including lawyers in the Air Force, court staff, law review editors, and attorneys in private firms. She publishes articles and regu regularly presents at national and regional conferences on critical reading, pedagogy and andragogy, and other legal writing topics. She focuses her scholarship on critical, reason critical reading, analogical reasoning, and global lawyering. Additionally, she holds positions in each of the national legal writing organizations, including the Legal Writing Institute, the Association of Legal Writing Directors, and the Legal Writing, Reasoning, and Research section of the American Association of Law Schools. Allwood recently recognized Professor Williams with the Outstanding Services Award for her chair, her work as chair, for the Allwood Guide Task Force. Professor Williams was chosen as an inaugural participant uh, in Allwood's Leadership Academy, as a recent Legal Writers Institute Writers Workshop Scholar, and as recipient of the prestigious LWI Allwood LexisNexis Legal Writing Scholarship Grant. Before joining academia, she spent eight years in big firm practice in Phoenix, where she litigated a range of complex commercial and land use matters, including cases involving condemnation, data breach class actions, complex judgment collections, and shareholder disputes at the state and federal levels. Super lawyers named Professor Williams as a rising star in 2016. Professor Paul Bennett is co-director of the clinics, director of the Child and Family Law Clinic, and clinical professor of law. He joined the College of Law in 1996 as the first director of the Child Advocacy Clinic, which has since merged with the Domestic Violence Law Clinic to form the Multidisciplinary Child and Family Law Clinic. In addition to clinical legal education, Professor Bennett teaches classes in family law, trial advocacy, law and humanities, juvenile law, and professional responsibility. In 2010, he was chosen by the Arizona Law Students to receive the John Strong Teaching Award. Professor Bennett joined the Arizona Law Faculty in 1996 after teaching for several years at Cornell Law School. Prior to entering the academy, he practiced with Orleans Legal Aid Bureau in Albion, New York, Chemung County Neighborhood Legal Services in Ithaca, New York, and later was a partner in private practice in a firm also in Ithaca, New York. Professor Bennett has long been active in Arizona's efforts to upgrade the quality of representation for children in the juvenile and family courts. He is a member of the nationally recognized Model Court Working Committee and has chaired its subcommittees on children's voice and parent-child visitation. Professor Bennett has long advocated that when children choose, they should be given a meaningful voice in the court proceedings that impact their lives. Professor Bennett is also co-author with the late Professor Kenny Hagland of A Short and Happy Guide to Being a Lawyer, which we will feature in this series two weeks from today. Professor Diana Simon is Associate Professor of Legal Writing and an Assistant Clinical Professor of Law. She currently teaches legal writing, analysis, persuasion, and advocacy. Professor Simon has been teaching at the law school for over 20 years and has taught various classes such as pre-trial litigation, civil procedure and contracts, practice labs, persuasive communication, advanced appellate advocacy, and moot court to first, second, and third year law students. She has also taught undergraduate business students at Eller School of Management. 
She brings with her over 23 years of experience as a practicing attorney. She has worked in Atlanta, Chicago, Washington, DC, Los Angeles, and Tucson. During these years, she has developed an expertise in ent entertainment related litigation, including copyright and trademark, as well as other areas such as general contracts litigation, insurance coverage, and employment law. Diana thoroughly enjoys mentoring students and seeing them develop into successful professionals. Now, after their initial comments, our guests will take questions from the audience here in the room, as well as on Zoom. So for our Zoom audience, please feel free to enter questions into the chat. Um, Professor Bennett will be monitoring the chat towards the end of the remarks. And you may also use your raised hand feature also in Zoom. So with that, please join me in welcoming our special guest, especially Professor Bennett. Start out really quickly today, just talking about the, a little bit the history of the OLED guide and what is OLED. OLED actually stands for the Association of Legal Writing Directors. In about the mid 90s, some of the leadership in OLED um, did it, their mission is to support um, legal writing professors in um, helping in their teaching, but also advocating for them at the national level. And one of the things that the leadership was talking about uh, was it was coming up with this idea of providing a textbook to help legal writing professors teach citation. Um, at the time, there was um, you know, a, a tools uh, to use to do citation, but there really wasn't a textbook that would really teach students who were just learning, just starting out in the legal field um, about citation. And so that's how the idea for the Always Guide was born. The first edition was printed in the year 2000, and it was done by um, a professor, now Dean Darby Dickerson, and um, a group of law professors from around the country who had gotten together and were a committee for her to help her um, go through all of, you know, they, they wrangled their collective experience and expertise in teaching students a legal citation for many years, to come up with the very first edition of the guide. And the first edition of the guide had a few things that were um, uh, in response to some, some critiques of legal citation that were going on in the outside world. And so because of that, um, the Always Guide had a few things that were, that were different that had introduced um, different ways of doing uh, citation into that, and especially um, in streamlining a little bit more the, the uh, abbreviations that we use and things like that. And then uh, Dean Darby Dickerson actually did the first four uh, uh, editions of the guide. And then um, she retired, you know, put it retired, or retired from the book, became Dean, and uh, Colin Barger actually authored the fifth and the sixth edition um, that came out in 2014 and 2017. And so that's kind of the, in, in each of the editions of the book, um, the OLED organization lent its members expertise and help in deciding, you know, um, what should be included and how, um, how it should be presented and are the changes that we're making into the guide for these editions. Um, and also practitioners, one of the things, one of the reasons that uh, OLED started to, uh, that wanted to create the Always Guide was also uh, to help practitioners and have an emphasis on the citations that practitioners use, not so much a, an emphasis on the citation format that you would use for scholarly academic writing. And so there was this emphasis in the guide so that when, if you were actually a practicing lawyer, this was going to be a better tool for you to use because you didn't have to adapt your citations out of the academic format context, the formatting context to be able to file something with the court. And so those were kind of the two uh, reasons that the Alder guide got started. Um, yeah. Well, let me ask you, Carol, two part question. Um, why you? Why did Professor Williams choose this massive undertaking? Um, and, and the second part, why, why did Alwood choose you? Or how did they choose? Um, so I, when I started teaching uh, two years ago now, I became involved with the Allwood organization 
And um, the president at the time asked me if I uh, wanted to be on the All Invite Task Force Committee. And I said, sure, I'm going to get involved in any, any way I can. So I got involved with that. Um, in the task force and started learning a little bit more about the background and, and how all with um, supports uh, the guide. And um, as part of that effort, one of the things that I did was organize a survey of uh, um, all of the legal writing professors uh, in the country to contribute to the survey and tell, um, and tell all with, what do you want to see in the upcoming all with, um, all with guide? I mean, what is it that would help you um, to teach it? Are there teaching tools that you would need? Are there, um, you know, what are your barriers to adopting it? Uh, things like that. And so I headed up that, uh, that survey and, and you know, wrote the whole thing and got it and got all that information and then helped the task force to kind of talk to the Olive Bay leadership and say, this is, these are the things that would make a difference to professors and these are the things that we should focus on for the next edition. So I was already kind of very um, in, kind of in the thick of it with that. And the, the All With Guide, um, Pauline Barger, the previous author, had retired and they did a national search. They put out a call for anyone who wanted to be the next author. And you had to prepare a, a set of application materials um, for that. And they narrowed it down to four professors, um, four people uh, throughout the nation after that nationwide call. And then those four of us, the finalists, had to prepare um, a, a much larger packet that had some examples of what we would change. We had to go through um, a section of the guide and talk about what, what, how we would improve it, what, what our goals were, um, and then both the Albit uh, board of directors and the publisher, Walters Kluwer, had um, it was a blind submission process for them. They didn't know which um, professors had submitted what materials, but they took a look at those materials that we prepared, and um, each of them chose, each of those two groups chose which, um, which proposal that they liked uh, most, and they chose me. Now, why would I, why did I want to do it? I've loved citations since I was a student, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I haven't. Uh, I've been very uh, involved in it. I was the, it was named the, the um, staff of the year when I was on my uh, on my law school's uh, flagship law review, and then I became the editor in chief. And of course, all the all the my my new citation questions that, that couldn't be answered in anything would come to me at that point. I'd be like, "Well, this is the way we're going to do it now, as long as it's consistent with everything." There's no so I just really enjoyed um, I, I've enjoyed citation. I probably go too much about <laughs> but I definitely enjoyed the process so it it, it was something that um that, that attracted me but I thought I did I could do this and I you couldn't do it I did <laughs> did you consult with anyone when you're advising the guy yes so um a, a couple different um so not only did I have a few research assistants some of my uh Law students right here at the University of Arizona uh, helped me. And then, um, and as we went through and we're kind of going through making the different decisions of what we wanted to add and what we wanted to change, I had some peer reviewers who were um, legal writing professors, some of which are in this room, and um, from across the country, and also some practitioners. I wanted to talk to actual um, attorneys that were uh, practicing in the field, especially through. The global pandemic when the practice of law was changing so much and this is the year that in 2020 was the year i was revising the guide and so i wanted to say what is what is it that has changed about the practice of law that the all the guide can address what are the ways that um, practitioners are citing now what are the sources that they're citing now and what what's missing and so um with each of the changes that i would make or things that i thought would be improvements i would talk to these peer reviewers and ask them you know, what do you think about this particular change? What do you think this is a good idea? Um, you know, is this how you practice? Especially the practitioner was really eye-opening for me, and it led to a lot of different um, overhaul of, of, of different sections of the guide because I really wanted it to be something that practitioners could say, yes, this makes sense. This is a better way to do citations, especially for documents that were filed in court. This makes a lot more sense to me. Um, so that was something that was important to me. 
kind of get that perspective. And um, for appendix two, one of the appendix, uh, appendix um, uh, that's at the back of the guide focuses on local court rules. And so one of the things that was important to me is to not just only take the local rules that we could find online or we could find in our sources, but to ask attorneys and judges and clinicians that were working in those local areas in those different jurisdictions, is this right? Do you have anything to add to this? And so we reached out to someone in every state, um, you know, we tried to get a really good mix of judges, practitioners, um, clinicians, law professors to say, how does this look to you? This is what we have for this particular jurisdiction. Is this, um, is this reflective of the jurisdiction that you practice in? So those are also uh, an important uh, group of people to talk to. So following up on that, what were your main goals? What did you want to accomplish with the seven so uh, there were a couple of different things that were really important to me. I think the number one um, thing that was really important to me was to make sure that the citations that resulted from using the Allwood Guide um, conformed to national standards of um, legal citation to make sure that it was ev everything in the Allwood Guide is consistent with the book. So it didn't matter which citation guide you used, it would result in exactly the same citations. Um, because in earlier versions of the Allwood Guide, one of the one of the um, reasons that it came about was there was some pushback on some changes that we looked at done. And so all it differed in those first couple editions in small ways like the abbreviations. And so it was important to me going forward to make sure that every single thing um, that came out of that was reflective um, would be consistent with, um, with the book. And so to that end, we, me and my research assistants went through and put uh, call outs after every sentence that, that the blue book address that said this is exactly where you could find this particular rule in blue book and if it doesn't have a citation after that it means that the blue book just doesn't address that particular issue which there's quite a few if you go through there's quite a few things that blue book doesn't address um, that all we've covers a lot because it's its purpose was different its purpose is to be for practitioners and also to teach citations so it starts from a a position of thinking that the reader of the all would guide doesn't have legal background. So it explains in a lot more depth what the different pieces of the citation are so that um, it doesn't assume that you come in with that knowledge. So that was one, um, one thing. Another, uh, another big goal, of course, is to make sure that it was really easy for students to use. And thinking about when I teach students, what is it that they, how, how do they learn? How do students learn what works for them? Um, and to really think about um, how to incorporate those different things in the book, how to incorporate more visuals, more diagrams, more explanations. Um, that was really important. And also to focus on the guide as a really practical resource for practitioners, for paralegals and for lawyers that are out practicing law. And so again, that was one of the main goals of the all Guide from the very beginning, and I really wanted to carry that through. And a lot of that is reflected on all the discussions that I had with people who are actually practicing law. It doesn't feel like I've been out of law for too long, but I figure I started teaching in 2015 and got out of practice entirely in 2016. And so I feel like, well, it's been five years. Nothing, you know, it shouldn't have changed that much. But there have been so many changes in the past few years, it was really important to get that practitioner's view and what would be really helpful to a practitioner. Um, so what are the, I assume the call outs are different in this edition, but what are the other main differences between the seventh edition and this edition? So there's a couple, yes, there's an additional appendix eight that houses all the call outs um, to the blue book. So that if you were on a law review that requires you to, uh, to consult blue book, you could still use the Allwood guide and you could write down exactly where you would where you would find that particular rule in the blue book. So there's that. There are a lot more additional sources um, that aren't included in any other citation manual. And so, for example, one of the things that I was looking at when I um, was looking just how to cite to interviews, it assumed that you know, all the citation manuals assume that you would be interviewing somebody in person or on the telephone, which is not great. And going forward, probably won't be how a lot of interviewers are going either. And so this address, what do you do if you're interviewing somebody on a virtual platform? What do you do if you're interviewing them over Zoom? 
how do you cite to that? How do you, how, how do you address that? It would also um, address things like speeches that are online or presentations. How do you cite to a presentation that you were virtually at, but you weren't in person and, and nobody else was addressing how you do that? And, and so students were trying to mimic what they had to work with, but didn't have a really good guide of where to go and how to address those things. And there were also um, there were also holes like how do you cite to text? There are some practices of law that you are citing to text or citing to shared work drives, right? How do you how do you cite to something where you've got a corporation who does all of their work in Microsoft Teams and they have documents in there and they have chats now? How do you deal with those types of citation issues, which nobody else had addressed? And so there are a lot of technological sources that I address in the guide that nobody else had ever thought about. And so that was one of the things that was really important. Um, because of that too, if there's expanded coverage on how to cite to different um, commercial databases, because there are getting to be more and more databases um, that are out there besides just Westlaw and Lexis. And so it's also thinking about those other sources of where students might find the students and practitioners are going to be getting their legal information from and how do they um, cite to that. So there's a lot more examples of how you would cite to different uh, commercial databases in there. Um, there was I, the, the two sections that had to do with citing to your own um, your own materials. If you're working on a case and you're trying to cite to the complaint that was filed in the case or the motion for summary judgment that was filed in that case, those sections were really overhauled a lot because um, in almost every jurisdiction now you've got electronic filing and a lot of um, a lot of practitioners just refer to you know that not only the docket number but PCF number for the electronic filing, and so the the way that practitioners refer to those documents in practice is actually very different um, than than they had in the past. And so I, there were a lot of changes that I made uh, to those practice documents. Things. And um, the other thing that was really important to me as we started going through the the, the guide was looking at the examples. Um, and what was represented in the guide as examples, and to really make a concerted effort to show more diversity in that. Um, there are a lot of legal sources that were written by white men, which is fine, but there are so many other um, people that have contributed to the legal community, and I wanted those people reflected in the guide. Um, so not only in the sources themselves, so the topics that that were in the examples, but also authors and editors that reflect a more diverse um, group that, that makes up our, our legal community. And I, that was really important to me. So there are a lot of examples that were changed and updated um, based on that as well. As a student and now a teacher of citation, what are your favorite features of the all guide? So I think one of, the, one of my favorite um, ones as a student was in the Ovid Guide, uh, there's red triangles that indicate where species go in citation. It's, it's so hard to see sometimes in that little tiny print where the spaces go in this. I feel like should this be in that? And so I like the fact that there were um, that there are red triangles as a student. That was really helpful to me. And of course, I carried that through. I also really like the component diagrams. Um, at the beginning of each source, there's just a, a gray box that shows you here are the different components, and this is how they would look. And I color coded them because I'm very visual. So I wanted to make sure that they were consistent with each other. I wanted to add more component diagrams because I think that's really helpful for students rather than to say, here, just look at an example and figure out what the components are. It's really important to have somebody that says, here, this is what this component should be, this is what this component should be, this is what it should be. This is, you know, this is where you change a little bit depending on that. So um, those component diagrams are important. And the sidebars. I like the sidebars because students want to know why, right? So like, I don't know what an ECF number is. I've never filed a case or I have no idea what these are is. What is that? And so just to be able to put these sidebars in and tell students a little bit more about the legal um, practice that they're going into is really important. It also kind of gives you some background so you're able to create citations better because you understand the sources a little bit more. Um, and also the snapshots. One of the things that I really like is that there are snapshots of actual pages from books, from legal books or from, um, or from databases that say, look, this is 
when we're talking about star pagination, here's what Lexa's screenshot looks like, and here is where the star, where the pages are, and this is what it looks like. That was really important to me as well. That I like. There's so much you've done. Um, but are there things that you wanted to do that you weren't able to do or didn't get what you would like to do? Yeah, one is <laughs> one was really a little funny and one was more serious. So when I was looking at the um, sixth edition for the academic formatting, so the, the way that the guide is set up is it focuses on, on citations for practitioners. And at the end, if there are any differences that you would have to um, change whether in the font or um, or something else for academic formatting. There's a little signal that says academic formatting, and the rule itself has a little uh, call out that said FN. And I thought, well, if it's academic formatting, shouldn't it say AF? That makes a little more sense to me, not FN. And so we started changing all of them until one of my one of my um, research assistants said, "You realize you're putting AF after like." <laughs> <laughs> like oh yeah. Okay. Never mind. We're going back to FF. So we, we, we checked that. We didn't do that. We left it as FF. Like so this one did probably get a good idea. Um, but another thing that I went in uh, thinking about was there are so many. Of course, being here in Arizona, um, we have a, a, a lot of tribal courts and a, a lot of. Um, Native American sources are missing from citation manuals. And I thought I would really like to add more Native American sources and really get to how, how and I started looking around and asking if, if we were citing to a different tribal court, is there a standard for these different citations? And so we really, I went into this thinking, that's what I really want to add. And I actually stopped because we, we started researching, um, we started researching different uh, tribes and how their court systems were, and it felt very wrong to me at some point to tell tribal courts how they should be citing in their courts. And so we stopped and paused and said, this is something that I think is important, but I also think that it's important for us to have those conversations with each of the tribes that we want to include in here. But say, number one, do you want to be included? There, we were getting the sense sometimes when we were researching different sources that um, tribes did not want their information out into the general public and it would have been offensive to put it in there. So number one, ask permission, do you want, and then ask how, how do you want it to look? Not me saying this is how you should cite, but really asking the courts. And so I realized that this was going to be a much bigger project than I could get done in one year. This is going to be in the next edition of the edition after when, when I actually can have those conversations um, because those will take that will take a while. So you talked about appendix eight earlier. That's the call out. How convenient will it be for students who buy the Allwood guide to then learn how to cite the blue book when they are the copy work or smudge work? Yeah. So some um, law reviews do require a blue book, and so one of the things that I really wanted to concentrate on were after. Every sentence, there is a very insight, I mean, down to the very closest rule in Blue Book after every single sentence. So all they have to do is say, I use the Allwood Guide, I know that this is the way that this citation needs to change. And they can just flip to Appendix 8 and write out that say, say this is where Blue Book says that this should change as well. It was really important that we checked and triple checked and quadruple checked that each one of those uh, works so for students that are doing. Let's sort of talk in general for what are all these appendices and why are some online and some not? So, different, um, different appendices focus on different things. So, appendix one focuses on um, jurisdictions, uh, different jurisdictions, primary sources. So, their state laws, their um, the case law books. And then, appendix two is one that's online. Appendix two and appendix five are both online. Appendix two are those local sources that I talked about earlier, those um, local court rules that say here, if you, you know, if you're a law student and you are here in Arizona, you might just be focused on Arizona cases, but if you get an internship and you're going to Washington, D.C., or you're going to um, Oregon, or you, you know, you're going to a different jurisdiction, where would you find those court citation rules if you're, if you're looking for it? So it has all the information about what you would need for those local jurisdictions and local practices. Um, that they might have, 
And when we got such a great response from people across the country on this, I thought I want to be able to put this online. It's free for anyone. It's on the Walters who are the publisher's website. So anyone can go on and they can take a look. And we thought this is something because so many people made an effort to help in this and wanted to make it something that was um, free for everyone. Appendix five is something that um, it's one of my favorite parts of the book. And uh, it is all the periodicals, tons and tons of different periodicals, hundreds of them, and their abbreviations. And so one of the things that you have to do if you are trying to cite to a different law review or some sort of periodical, you have to look up every single word and, um, or you would have to know every single spacing rule and every abbreviation and craft your own abbreviation for periodicals. And that takes a lot of time, <laughs> it takes a lot of effort. So Appendix 5 takes all that guesswork out for you. It's just alphabetical. You can look up the periodical and say, this is what it is, and here's the abbreviation. I don't have to memorize all those rules. I don't have to look up every word to try and see what the abbreviation for that would be. It's really simple. And this is, it was such a time saver for me as a law student when I was on uh, law review to be able to just look it up and that it was really important that everyone had access to that. So again, I put Appendix 5 online so that no matter what um, citation manual you're using, you can go to that and you can just check whatever it is that you tried to do and, and say, okay, this is this is the correct way to abbreviate and it's got the correct spacing for you all that. So that is free online on Walter Spur's website as well for anyone. Were, are there any small differences between Google and Google? Yeah, so there were a couple of things to me that just didn't make sense. And I can, I can count on one hand the things that are different. So one, um, Blue Book still has E-M-A-I-L. So if they were talking, if you had a citation and they had email, it would say E-M-A-I-L, which is an older way of, of spelling it. And most of us just say E-M-A-I-L. And so in the Allwood Guide, I, I left out that because that didn't make sense to me. That's really tiny. Another um, example would be in the Blue Book, Lexis is all in capitals. So if you're citing to a database, uh, one of Lexis's databases, it would be capital L, capital E, capital X, capital Y, S. And I looked everywhere. Lexis doesn't do, I thought, where did this come from? Why Westlaw just has capital W and it's just called Westlaw? Why is Lexis in all caps? I looked everywhere. <laughs> I asked people for Lexis. I said, does anybody ever refer to it in all capitals? Nobody knew why it was in all capitals. It didn't make any sense to have it all in capitals. So let me all look at it. It's just capital L, E, X. Yes. One of the other things um, that I did in the Allwood Guide, and the Blue Book says, you know, you should, you, if you're taking it from a commercial database, you should attribute it to the database. At the time when, um, you know, years and years ago, it was just plain Westlaw. Now there are more iterations of Westlaw and Lexis. So, for example, Lexis last year just came out with a new product. It's Lexis Plus. And to me, I think it was important for me to show examples of exactly what database you're using, not just saying I'm using Lexis, but are you using Lexis Advantage, are you using Lexis Plus? What exactly are you using when you cite? And so there are small um, things like that that made more sense to just um, actually say this is Lexis Plus and show how that, uh, there, or this is Westlaw Edge and not Westlaw Classic. That you're using. Okay. We always teach students to writing is a process and you learn from the process. What did Professor Williams learn from this process? <laughs> I learned about so many legal sources that I forgot existed or didn't know. Um, you know, one of the things that I learned is that everybody has their opinion on citation. <laughs> and very strong opinions on citation. <laughs> Um, and they are not afraid to share it with you a lot, <laughs> which I think is great. But it, it did surprise me in how um, how strongly and passionately people feel about different citation formats, whether they like it, whether they don't, whether they feel very strongly about this rule or that rule. Or um, people have really people in the legal community have really strong opinions on, on that and have had to definitely navigate a lot of strong opinions on what I should not touch, what I should touch, what I should change, what I shouldn't change. Um, that's, that's been good. But I, it's also opened up a lot of um, good conversations for me as far as being able to um, talk about something that seems 
little boring to other people, but to find other people who are passionate about um, <laughs> the passion about different sources and how to cite them. So I read an article by Professor Stephen Homer, who is actually with us today on Zoom, um, called Hierarchies of Elitism and Gender, the Blue Book and the Allwood Guide. And it claims that the citation guide that legal writers choose is really an allegory or a metaphor for elitism and gender and bias in a legal field. Um, do you agree? And does that resonate with you? Yeah, so um, Professor Homer's article really uses a, um, a rhetorical device called, a device called synecdoche. And synecdoche just shows how one detail in a story tells the story as a whole. And so um, what he chose to show the synecdoche of um, elitism and um, gender bias in legal academia was to take the choice of whether to teach using the book or the Allwood guide. And, um, and showed how those two are, are a synecdoche for the whole of um, what we teach in legal academia. Um, and, and the contrast, the, the comparison is here you've got the Allwood Guide that is created by mostly women, because mostly women are in the legal writing field um, and that have years of expertise in this particular area. Um, and another choice of the Blue Book, which is written by um, students in some of the schools, Harvard, Yale, um, those that, that um, are definitely helped by other professors that are there, but it, it is mainly published by these elite schools. Um, and which you choose and like how you say, how you make that decision between the two um, respects different, uh, uh, different things that you think are important. Um, you know, and uh, so it's really interesting. Do I, I, a lot of things in this article really resonated with me as far as um, there, there definitely have been um, You know, comments on you know why would you need another? Why would you need the all the guide if, if, anyway? If you have a book, why would you even need it? Um, and a lot of it is because people don't understand that this is really a teaching tool to that backs up and teaches students how to view how to do citation rather than just saying, you know, here's a thesaurus, figure it out on your own, right? Like there there are differences between those two tools, and um, and so yeah, that that article definitely. Question in chat from Professor Dysart that I don't really understand, so I'm just going to read it. Okay. You. Can you talk about cleaned up in parentheses, excuse me, in quotes, as a parenthetical? Is it appropriate for attendees to use? Yeah, I actually did a sidebar um, in, on cleaned up citation. So, for those of you who don't know what a cleaned up citation is, in 2017, a law professor wrote about how it would be um, a really good idea for some of these different citations when you are quoting a source. And also quotes a source and also quotes, you, you have to, um, in, in more formal writing, show exactly what was changed. You have to use brackets, you have to have ellipses, you know, brackets if you change letters or if you omit words, and if you omit different words, you have to use these different ellipses. And so it gets to be very busy with lots of different symbols. So as you're reading through it, you're trying to skip over all of these different changes that the writer has made from the original source, and it gets to so cleaned up citation is basically just saying, I've left out all of that gobbledygook. I'm not writing brackets. I'm not writing ellipses to show you that it's changed. I'm just going to write it. And at the end of the citation, I'm going to write clean, citation cleaned up, which just means I've left out those indicators of how I changed the original source. Um, this is caught on because there are some US Supreme Court decisions that have the cleaned up citation that judges have used. And, there are quite a few Ninth Circuit cases. Um, now where Ninth Circuit judges are starting to use this cleaned up citation format when they're specifically just when they are quoting um, from different sources. My suggestion is the all guide is, number one, if you're a student, talk to your professor about that if you're turning something in. Do they want you to use this cleaned up citation? Because you know, in some, um, in some instances, especially in uh, the scholarship, legal scholarship, you will have to show how you changed a particular text. So you need to know that more formal way of indicating to your reader what you've changed, how you've changed it, what you've omitted, 
Um, so you, as a student, want to make sure that your professor, you're doing what your professor wants. My answer is, you know, if the judge wants to do it, a judge can do whatever they feel like. And so <laughs> if the judge wants to do it, that's fine. If you're a student, make sure that you um, ask. And if you're a practitioner, make sure that you're um, submitting documents to a judge, that that judge knows what cleaned up is, because it's not necessarily something that every practitioner understands quite yet. Um, and it's not something that either the Blue Book or the Always Guide um, uh, support or say you should do that. I think it makes it really difficult for students to, to be able to decide when you should use cleaned up and when you shouldn't. Um, and as you get into practice more, I think practitioners have a better grasp of like, it's not going to be that hard to throw one bracket into here. I don't need to like clean up. I'm just going to do the bracket and move on. Um, or to be able to say, okay, this is going to be just a super mess when I when I cite this, so I am going to just use this cleaned up because I know the judge that I'm in front of, and I know that this judge is going to understand that and is going to be upset and um, not find me using it. So. Uh, another question: uh, Do you have any insight as to the public domain citation? Yeah. So um, there are 16 jurisdictions. Uh, 16 different states and um, territories that use public domain citation. So basically what their courts have said is if you were filing something for us in our jurisdiction, you're going to use this citation format. And they give a very specific citation format that doesn't um, focus on any one particular uh, uh, publication source, either that was published by Thomson Reuters or something like that. But it just says this is the citation format that we want to use for our cases. In um, Appendix 2 of the Alwood Guide, we actually have the, all of the, um, if, if the jurisdiction does public citation format, it, it has exactly where that court order came from or where that rule is, and it gives an examples of what the public citation format should look like um, in that jurisdiction. Do I, you know, I think it, having looked at all of those, my feeling is, um, each of those public citation formats is different, right? You have 16 different ways. It's not like those public citation formats in those 16 jurisdictions are all the same. And so you have 16 different ways of citing. And if you aren't from that jurisdiction, you don't know what those different components stand for. You would have to look up the rule. You would have to look up citations um, to figure out what the different components of those particular ones are. So I'm not a big fan but not because I want to put your book, but because I think it's more difficult for people coming into the jurisdiction to understand those, um, those citations. Uh, whereas if you're using one citation format across the different jurisdictions, at least somebody coming into it, or if you're writing a, a note or a comment or you know, a, 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 another academic article, it's a lot easier for your, um, for your readers to understand those different citations. The folks in the room have a question. Yeah, just that quick on that. Is that the same as a neutral citation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But can I, can I follow up on that? Because neutral citations often lead to open access resources, would that be a reason for uh, writers to favor the neutral or public domain citation? Um, yeah, I mean, that is one argument, but the it's because if you were getting a case in, in an open format. Again, I, maybe that would be a reason to lean towards that, but I still think it's hard for legal writers to, or legal readers to interpret those different parts if they're not familiar with that particular domain. And so it, it lessens their, um, it weakens the, writer's ability to communicate information through a citation about the weight of the authority or the importance of that authority if the reader can't understand what the different components of that citation are. And so to me, because citation is partially to support what your assertion is in, in a way that communicates to the reader very important things, if your reader doesn't understand that particular citation format, because there are so many, even if it's neutral, because there's so many different ways to do it, it's harder to communicate that information. And that, and that makes sense since uh, the, the standard citations are mostly available open access through various formats now right. as well. So, yeah. Thank you. 
Um, so you talked a little bit about um, Blue Book and the authors of Blue Book. Um, did you have any communications with the recent uh, Blue Book? Oh, yes. Yeah. So many. <laughs> <laughs> so many. Like, um, yeah, so as I was going through, as you can imagine, I probably know Blue Book and Owen better than anybody on the planet. So going through <laughs> Blue Book and comparing the new revision of Blue Book for the 21st edition and, and going through and making uh, call outs for you know, where things would match up between all the guidance and Blue Book. There were a lot of things that I caught, but I could email and say, wait, you didn't, there's not a, an abbreviation. You took this abbreviation away. And so I would say brothers, for example, they used to be abbreviated B-R-O-S and now the abbreviation is gone. What happened? Was this on purpose? Was it an accident was left out? Um, things like that, where I would say, I'm looking at an example here in the Blue Book and the example doesn't seem to follow the text above it. You know, what's going on? Is this just a mistake in the example or, you know, where is that? So there were a lot of conversations back and forth of that kind where I would say, you know, what was the thought process behind this? And so, yeah, there were lots of, of conversations like that. And there were definitely conversations of, yep, that was a mistake, we'll get that fit. Which I totally get. I've already had people that have emailed me and said, hey, I think that there's, you're missing a parentheses on this, on page 319. <laughs> so. So I think that's, that's helpful. I was curious in, in interviewing different um, like practitioners to kind of figure out what would be useful for them to think about. Did you find different needs and like different discounts of that? Um, that you tried, or was it very similar? I, I, I think it was very similar. One of the things, you know, I talk mostly to litigators because I think those who need it. When you're writing contracts and doing transactional work, most of the time you're not citing in the same way you're maybe referring to something internal you know section this or whatever of whatever contract you're doing um so most of the people i talked to were litigators most of it most of our discussion is centered around um electronic finding and how that's kind of changed the information that they need um to be included in different documents so conversations really turned around that it didn't didn't really seem with what what area of law that they were litigating in did seem to make a difference. Yeah. Um, I, I heard you talk about, you know, kind of reaching out to practitioners, but did you reach out to any students beyond your research assistants? So some of the professors that I sent different local um, rules to would say, I'm going to ask my, you know, I'm going to ask my teaching assistant or my writing fellow or you know the other people that are on, the students that are at Marbury because they've gone out you know they, they have their summer jobs and they've been practicing culture so in that sense yes there were definitely students that were asked is this helpful is this um okay um so in that way yes and for my reading I think the other any other things that I got were from students who sent me emails um, that said this would be really helpful, and I did get student emails from across the country that said this would be really helpful if this was in the guide or if that was in the guide, or I don't understand that part. Um, but yeah, it would be it actually that's a really good idea to reach out even more thoroughly to say what is it that's helpful and what is it that's not helpful. Yeah, and then I kind of have a follow up question Did you ever like consider reaching out to people who are outside of the legal profession just from a sort of readability or a you know, completely blank slate under standability perspective. No, I can't say that I I can't say that I have thought about it before, um, to be honest, mostly because in my experience practicing, your client doesn't care. <laughs> your client can't read it anyway. They don't know what the pieces of the citation mean. It doesn't communicate anything to them. Most clients aren't going to care about it as long as it's in the format of the court's not going to pull it out as long as something decided it to them. So I guess that's why I probably didn't think about reaching out to somebody who wasn't legally trained and didn't understand the citation because it doesn't communicate something to them anyway. So, so I might have thought about it. I think we're just about out of time. Um, there are some other chat questions and I'm just going to volunteer Professor Williams to answer them if you email her. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor Williams. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so we do have lunch. Um, please, please.